You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. It's so good to see all of you here today. Welcome to Ram Church, Los Angeles, the perfect place for imperfect people. It's so good to see you. Um, today we're continuing in our series that we're calling Stranger Things. Um, it's a series as we're navigating through the book of Revelation. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. We got one clap. I'm glad somebody's excited about it. Amen. Uh, you know, we are a Bible church. And so more than an emotional experience, we want you to walk away with an understanding. So that's why we're walking through this book together. Amen. And what I found is that it's very unfortunate these days that many people, they come to church for a momentary emotional experience, but they don't walk away with an understanding. And so today our prayer is that we get an understanding so that it may impact and change our lifestyles. Amen. And I promise you this, we're going to get to topical series later on in the year. You know, I know y'all want to hear about relationships and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of YouTube series about that already. But I believe right now it's we should prioritize, before we get into interpersonal relationships, we should first set our eyes on our relationship with Jesus. And that's what this series is about. Because Revelation is about revealing Jesus. It's about him revealing himself to us so that we may see him clearly. Okay? And so today we're going to continue. At first I was going to try to, you know, rush through this. Like, preaching two and three chapters at a time. But I'm going to take my time. Amen. So today we're going to pick up literally where we left off. And so um, Revelation chapter 2. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. We're just going to talk about the first church, church in Ephesus today. And it reads, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write this. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but they are not. And you have found them to be false. Verse 3, you have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you have not grown weary. Jesus says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is, which is in the paradise of God. Father, this is your word. Tell me to teach it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I just want to talk to you from this simple subject, working hands and misplaced hearts working hands and misplaced hearts. And just to catch up everyone, catch everybody up, make sure we're on the same page. The author of this book is John, John the Beloved. He has been exiled to this island called Patmos. All right, we got some few people paying attention. This island called Patmos, okay? And the Bible tells us that he's been exiled there because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. He had a testimony about Jesus that he didn't keep to himself, okay? And so the logical question is, why would John be exiled during this time instead of murdered? Like, why not have him executed like the others? Well, during this time, um, for the Romans to kill such a significant leader at this time, it would have led to a revolt. It would have led to an upheaval. And that's something that the Romans at this time was not willing to risk. So they sentenced him to life on the island of Patmos, literally left there to rot, to die, um, to extinct. And so we talked about this last week. At John's lowest point in life, his lowest point in life, he chooses to worship. At a time in his life where he could literally not help himself get out of, he chooses to worship. He had no answers for what life was dishing his way, but he chose to worship. He was left sh stranded. He was abandoned. He was forgotten, yet he chose to worship. 
And the Bible tells us that when he worshiped, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. And I know we highlighted this last week, but it's, it's something how when we're going through the toughest times in our lives, we think the answer to our prayers should be a way of escape, a, a way out of our circumstance. We think an open door is the answer to our prayers. If our job gets crazy, we pray for a new job. If someone says something that rubs us the wrong way, we look for a new church. If our relationships get hard, we look for a new boo. You know how this goes. And, and I know you hear this often. You don't hear this often. But we have to stop talking about open doors all the time. Sometimes God doesn't want to give you a way out. He just wants you to see him while you're in it. And this isn't popular, but there are times when Jesus is going to tell you no. There are times Jesus will tell you no. There are times you will ask for a way of escape from your circumstances, and Jesus will say no. And to take it a step further, if I can be real, there are times that Jesus will tell you no, no matter how much you declare and decree a thing. You can declare and decree all day long, but there are times in spite of that, Jesus will still say no. It doesn't matter how much you name it and claim it. There are times where Jesus, in the midst of all that, will still tell you no. It doesn't matter how loud you scream it. There are times when your request simply doesn't align with the will of God for your life in that season. And because what we learned from John is that we don't necessarily need a way out. We just got to learn to look for Jesus while we're going through the circumstances. This reminded me of a story in the book of Daniel. You've heard this before, the three Hebrew boys. When when they were cast into the furnace, when they were told that they were going to be cast into the furnace, they didn't pray for a way out of the fire. They did not pray for a way out of the fire. And when they were thrown in the fire, they saw Jesus in the fire with them. Sometimes it's not God's will to snatch you out of the flames. But it is his will that you will learn to see him through worship, even when the furnace of life gets a little too hot. In the worst season of John's life, he worships. And when he worships, he sees Jesus. And John, he's writing to these seven specific churches, but in addressing these seven specific churches, he's also addressing all churches. And we know this to be true because when you look at these letters in chapter 2 and 3, as he's addressing these churches, he will tell them, he who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church is. Plural. Okay, growing up with my brother, my older brother, we're 15 months apart, but when he got in trouble about something, witnessing him get disciplined about a thing, I learned really early on that my parents didn't have to teach me about that. When I saw him get whooped for something, I knew they didn't have to have a conversation with me about it. I knew that I was not going to do that if I didn't want to get that kind of discipline, okay? And it's the same thing here. Uh, when, when, When Jesus is addressing these churches, we have to look at what he's telling them, look at what he's commending them about, look at what he's condemning them for, and learn the lesson early. We've got to learn the lesson early. It's a lesson my pastor taught me at Ram Church, Texas. He says, some things you aren't taught, they just have to be caught. They have to be caught. Meaning, as you're serving, as you're close, as you're around, every lesson doesn't need to be packaged and directly addressed to you in order for you to learn from it. Right? So what we see here, as Jesus is commending and condemning certain practices In these churches, we have to apply them even to Ramp Church Los Angeles. These are lessons we should learn in order for us to be the church that Christ is calling us to be. Amen. And so the first message that Jesus wants to get this letter to is this church in Ephesus. And why Ephesus? He writes to them, firstly, because they are the most influential city of these seven churches the most influential city in Asia Minor. And so, therefore, they're the most influential church of these seven churches, okay? And so, similar to Los Angeles, Ephesus was known. It was a hub 
for all different types of nationalities and peoples and cultures to come to this one place to gaze upon the beauty of the city. Ephesus was a place that you would visit if you wanted to see Rome's politics on full display. But Ephesus was also known for its polytheism. They worshiped many gods. And they really took issue, this will, you know, sound familiar to some of you, but they really took issue to those who claimed that there was one way. They really took issue to those who claimed that there's only one real God in spite of all of these deities. Each major city in this time was known for um, its pagan temples of worship. And in Ephesus, they made sacrifices to an idol called Diana or also known as Artemis. She was a fertility goddess, okay? She was the embodiment of sexuality and sexual lust during this time. And the temple that Rome built for her, it sat on a platform that was over 100,000 square feet. That's twice the size of an NFL football field. So Ephesus, it was the epicenter of wickedness and idolatry. And because many of us, we've been poorly taught about Sodom and Gomorrah, We tend to think that God withdraws his hand from the most wicked of places. But if that's the case, if God withdrew his hand from the most wicked of places, God would have withdrew his hand from our lives a long time ago. Like God has done throughout each dispensation, when God saw the wickedness in Ephesus, when God saw their idolatry, when he saw them building temples to to idols and false gods, he did not turn his back on them. He did not turn his back. He didn't send those who, quote, unquote, called themselves Christians, but he sent those who were on the front lines of his kingdom. Those who were willing to let their light shine in the darkness called Ephesus. That's who Jesus sent. And while many legalistic Jews moved out of the city of Ephesus to uphold their false sense of righteousness, new converts like Paul had a desire to go into the city that all of these religious folks were running from. He had a desire to go into it. And because Paul had a desire to bring the light of the gospel into the wickedness of Ephesus, a church in Ephesus was birthed. And I want you to go back and read this later. It's in Acts chapter 18 through 20. When you read this, you will see out of all the cities that Paul visited on his missionary journeys, he stayed in Ephesus the longest. He stayed there the longest. And when you look at Acts 19, 8 through 10, it tells us that Paul was entering the synagogues. He was arguing. He was preaching and defending the gospel. And Paul was committed to staying in this place that Christians were running away from. And you will see in Acts 19, 18 through 20, that Paul's efforts, his desire to see other people saved, it paid off. God blessed his efforts there as he was serving as a missionary in Ephesus. And you will read this in Acts 19, that because of the preaching of Jesus, people who were practicing black magic and dark arts, they brought $50,000 worth, days wages worth of, of, of scrolls and things they were using to cast spells, and they set them on fire. And later in that same chapter, Acts 19, Paul is making disciples who are making disciples who are making disciples. And they're literally talking about Jesus at coffee shops. They're talking about Jesus at work. They're talking about Jesus at rehearsal. They're talking about Jesus with their friends and with their families. They're talking about Jesus when they go to the gym. Literally everywhere that they go, the disciples that Paul is cultivating, they're talking about Jesus everywhere. They are studying the scriptures and sharing. They're studying the scriptures and sharing. We just study sometimes, but we don't share it often. And because they are actively participating in the Great Commission to to make disciples, to go into the world and make disciples, they aren't passively participating like you and I sometimes. They are participating not just when they feel like it. They aren't just participating in the Great Commission when they have a microphone. But because they are actively participating in the Great Commission, it disrupted the economy of the whole city. The whole city. Ephesus, he made, uh, they made a bulk of their money by selling the small pocket statues of Diana and Artemis. But Acts 19 tells us that because Paul is preaching Jesus, 
Because Paul is telling them that if you create a God with your hands, that God is not worth you worshiping. The Bible says that the sales of the idols dropped and it shattered the economy of Ephesus. People stopped buying the idols. Acts 19 tells us that the craftsmen of these idols, they were convinced that Paul had converted the whole city to Jesus. And it says that they gathered a group of protesters and they caused a riot. The preaching of Jesus, it caused a riot in Ephesus. And it forced Paul to flee from the city so that his life could be spared. What's the point of all this? When the church decides to graduate from self-proclaimed Christians to becoming disciples of Jesus Christ and actually open your mouth to talk about Jesus, it will disrupt Satan's economy in the region. That's the point. And here's what I want you to hear. Stop calling yourself a Christian if you don't have a burden to see lost people come to know Jesus. Many self-proclaimed Christians have this mindset, child, they can believe what they want to believe. They can do what they want to do. That ain't got nothing to do with me. And that may sound cute, but it's the flesh. It's not biblical, and that's not the characteristic of one who is a true follower of Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you is that God will eventually break your heart with the things that break his heart. That his passion to see lost people come to know him would also become your passion. Jesus, he sacrificed his life for us to know him and to enter into a saving relationship with him. But we can't even sacrifice a few minutes for a conversation about him. And what's our excuse? We say because we're nervous. We say because it's not our personality type. And yes, you may be nervous, but I think Jesus is worth you pushing past that to talk about the goodness of him in your life. And so now because of Paul's efforts in Ephesus, um, and then Aquila and Priscilla, he would lead them there to lead the church. And then Timothy. And then once Timothy was executed, the apostle John would become the pastor of the church at Ephesus until he was exiled. And because of their influence in Ephesus, because of their influence in Asia Minor, God addresses them first. And so Jesus, he gives his revelation to John. And where we see these verses in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Here the author, we talked about this before, he wants us to know that this message that you're about to hear, it does not come from man. It does not come from from just um, this apostle. This are words coming from Jesus that I need you to hear. So he says, no, these words are coming from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hands. Okay. And because Jesus is omnipresent, because he's everywhere, both past, present, and future, because he's all-knowing, he sends this message to the church at Ephesus because he knows until he returns, every single church that will ever exist will need to be reminded of this message time and time again. And because Jesus stands in the middle of his churches, because he walks among the churches, we can trust him when he says in verse 2, I know your deeds. That's what he says. In other words, this is not a good guess. I know your deeds. This is not a hypothesis. This isn't a half-true prophecy that we're used to hearing. He says, I know your deeds. And he begins with a commendation. He begins with words of praise. He he begins with, with adoration, right? And he commends them for their deeds. This church was known for their actions. This church was known for their doing. You wouldn't be able to make a post about this church saying, I wish the church could do more of this. I wish the church could do more of that. No, no. The church at Ephesus was doing all that plus some. They had every ministry. They had every outreach. They had every evangelism effort that you could think of. They had it, and they were doing it. And this wasn't the kind of church where 20% of the members were active and 80% you just saw when you did. This wasn't that kind of church. This wasn't the kind of church where 20% of the members was carrying 100% of the ministry burden. They were all pulling their weight on the front hands, on the front lines advancing the kingdom of God. Jesus says, I know their deeds. I know that they work hard. This church didn't have to be convinced to serve. This church, they didn't have to be convinced that they should show up. But the church at Ephesus 
There was no distinction between a member and one who served. Everybody did something for the sake of the gospel. These days, you can literally join a church and not do anything for years and still call yourself a member. But no, at this church, everybody had their hand to the plow working. Next, Jesus says he knows the perseverance. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, perseverance, it is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Perseverance, it is persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Meaning, their commitment to the kingdom and the context of their local assembly, it lasted beyond their quarrels and conflict. Their commitment didn't change. It didn't change when ministry got hard. Their commitment to their church, it didn't stop when they faced challenges and persecution. They were persistent. They persevered, meaning that they had an inner attitude of long-suffering and patient endurance of hardship. They knew how to go through without their trials and tribulations, shifting and, and stifling their relationship with Jesus. That's what they did. And I know when we talk about the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we tend to jump to speaking in tongues only. And we forget about the fruit of the Spirit called long-suffering. Long-suffering. And Jesus wrote this letter to Ephesus because he knew there will be churches that come along the way filled with people who had a fire for Jesus, but they did not have perseverance. They, They had a fire that never lasted. A fire that never stood the test of time. When life hits this generation of believers, when things get hard, we run away. Nobody stays anymore. When covenant relationship gets hard, nobody stays. When things get hard, we rather leave than endure to see what God has at the end of that. When work gets a little too much, we hop around. We're never stable. And when you look at the scriptures closely, you'll see instability and constant movement. You know, we always talk about, I'm just in transition. God has me in transition. That, that whole philosophy in scriptures, that was characterized as a curse of people who were, lived a nomadic lifestyle. They were a nation without a home. That's not a blessing of God. Constant movement, constant transition, instability, that is not what God wants for his children. That's not what he wants. But when our flesh and feelings tell us to walk away from something God called us to, we forfeit the blessing God has for us at the end. Endurance means to abide with God even in the middle of a storm. To choose to stay with Jesus even when life gets hard. And I'm telling you, while it seems easier to walk away, When it's all said and done, you're going to rather abide with God in the storm than take it on by yourself. God has a way of anchoring those who remain. Next, Jesus commends them in the same verse, chapter 2, verse 2. He says, I know that you do not tolerate wicked people. That's what your Bible says. He's commending them because they do not tolerate wicked people. People, this is critical for our cultural climate today, climate, because today you are praised and you are high-fived based on how tolerant to sin that you are. And if you stand with what God calls sin, your view is labeled as hate speech. And you will be called a bigot for standing on the side of biblical truth. But the church at Ephesus, they were willing to die for their faith. And they made it their business to guard the church against the intrusion of unholy things and ideas. But today in our churches, we try to see how much of the culture we can mix in with the church, all in the name of growing the ministry. And we have become so seeker-friendly that we have become God-offensive. And I'm here to tell you right now, here at RCLA, we're not interested in being trendy. We're interested in being faithful to what God's word says. Because when it's all said and done, we're not going to have to stand before the culture and give an account. 
We're not going to have to stand before our coworkers and give an account. We're going to have to stand before God. And when we stand before God at that time, your opinions about truth does not matter. At that point, only truth matters. In my life, your life is going to be judged based on the weight of truth. Not our idea of truth. Not the government's idea of truth. Not the president's idea of truth but on God's idea and standard of truth. And the only thing I want to hear him say when we stand before him is, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Doesn't say popular. It doesn't say trendy. It says, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. The church at Ephesus, they did not tolerate wickedness. They didn't put up with it. They upheld the Lord's standard of righteousness, even though it was not popular. And next, Jesus, he says, he commends them again. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but they are not, and you have found them to be false. The church at Ephesus, they wasn't interested in sound bites and cliches. Just because something sounded good, it didn't mean you were going to get their amen. Just because it had views, it didn't mean that you were going to get them to like, comment, and share that video. This church was like the Bereans in Acts 17. The Bible says when Paul went to Berea and he started preaching the good news of the gospel, before the people jumped into a praise break, they examined the scriptures for themselves to see if Paul's words aligned with the scripture. And because the average Christian does not study the scriptures for themselves, it's easy to be deceived. It's easy to be deceived when somebody says something that our itching ears and our flesh wants to hear. The church at Ephesus, they didn't care what your title was. They didn't care whether you was an apostle, a bishop, or a reverend doctor. Because they they wanted to know if what you said, if it lined up with this book. They line up. So before they queued up the click track, they said, no, pull out the scriptures and let's verify this before we seal it with the praise. We are quick to put a praise on something that God did not even say in his word. And we're dancing and we're sweating and we're shouting over something God ain't even said. But, but when you know the word for yourself, your praise your worship, your prayer life, you you can trust it. You can get all the way in because you know what the book says for yourself. For yourself. The church at Ephesus, they knew the word. So when one came and called themselves something, they could mark them as false if they missed the mark based on what Scripture said. They wasn't apostles, but they knew the truth. Sometimes we think knowing the word of God is for those who's teaching it. For those who's preaching, for those who's on staff, those who are leading. No, no, no. Knowing the word of God is for every single person who calls themselves a believer. And if you don't know the word, I'm telling you, you will be deceived. We are too old to still be going off of vacation Bible school studies we learned at five years old. We've got to build on that theology if we don't want to be swayed in this life, in this culture. Because people, they have arguments that sound so good, I'm telling you. They have ideas and opinions that will have you second-guessing yourself if you don't commit to the daily studying of this word. I'm telling you, the church at Ephesus, they knew the word. So when one called himself a pastor, a bishop, an evangelist, They could mark them as false if their message was not true. This is a good church. This is a church that, you know, every pastor would want to pastor this kind of church. They're doing. They're studying the word of God. They're calling out sin. We don't believe in that no more. They're calling out sin. They're they're, they're doing this thing. And you would think this is the model church. You would think this is the church that we should all strive to be like. They've had great pastors. They've had model leadership. What could go wrong? Remember in chapter 1, in John's vision of Jesus, he says that Jesus' eyes were like a blazing fire. 
And while the natural eye cannot see beyond the surface, Jesus takes one look at Ephesus with his piercing eye of flame, and he discovers a devastating flaw. And so now he moves from commendation in the first three verses to now condemnation in verse 4. And he says, you do a lot of good things, but I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You have abandoned, you've walked away from your first love. And remember, Jesus, he's not just standing in the middle of his church. He's also walking among his churches, inspecting them. And in this inspection, he doesn't just take into account good deeds. Some of us, we build our whole devotional life around doing good deeds. But Jesus, he takes more than the good deeds into account when he's evaluating your life. With his piercing eye, he sees through all of the activity. He sees through all the singing, all of the serving, all of the attendance. He sees beyond that. And he looks to the one thing that matters, the condition of the heart. This church at Ephesus, they had everything. They were doing everything, but they forgot the one thing that Jesus actually deserves, and that's our love for him. They had right behavior, but affection and intimacy were absent. And when love walks out the door, when love walks out of the door, so does our worship. Jesus says, you have left your first love. And remember, week one, I told you Revelation is really about a wedding. And so the image that the author wants us to get here in this verse is this picture of a bride leaving her groom at the altar. Imagine the pain of seeing the one you love with all of your heart, the one you have literally sacrificed your life for, leaving you at the altar and falling in love with another. This is the heartbreak that Jesus has to deal with every single day when it comes to our sin. He stands at the altar, and he's waiting for us. He's waiting for our yes, yet we fall in love with materialism. We fall in love with comfort. We fall in love with entertainment, with gigs and opportunity. We fall in love with money. And like God has been saying since the time of Israel, as he stands at the altar, what have I done besides love you when nobody else did? What have I done besides love you when you were at your absolute lowest point in life that would cause you to consistently leave me at the altar for another? Jesus is saying, yes, you're coming to church. Yes, you're coming to church. You used to be excited about gathering and worshiping, but now church has become a chore to you. I want you all to hear me very clear on this. It has become an obligation. Church has now become a daunting task. Your mindset used to be, I get to show up and serve. I get to hold the greeting signs. I get to sing. I get to pray. I get to play the instruments. But now because your love for Christ have walked away, your philosophy has changed from I get to serve to I have to serve. I have to show up. I have to go to life groups. I have to take these pictures. I have to volunteer with the kids today. I have to give. There was a time you had a heart to give and to sow into the kingdom of God freely. There was a time in your walk with the Lord where you didn't care about the length of service. You didn't care about how long the sermon was. There was a time during the sermon you were taking notes, but now you just scroll on your phone. There was a time you looked forward to coming to church. Now you're looking forward to church ending so you can go back to the same lifestyle that you love so dearly. There was a time you had a desire to spend time in God's word. There was a time you loved praying and worshiping and communing with God every single day. 
but now you just keep putting it off to the next day and to the next day. Now you just get to reading scriptures and praying when you get a chance. You just get to it when you can, but you get to everything else on your task list. When you allow your love for Christ to walk out the door, what you used to view as a beautiful opportunity with him becomes nothing more than a daunting obligation. When you really love someone, you do whatever it takes to be in their presence. When you really love someone, you are attentive to their desires. You are eager to please them. You don't let anything get in the way of your time with that special someone. But now, the one who gave his life for you, the most he is worthy of is the leftovers at the end of your day. All that he's worthy of is the three minutes you have before falling asleep. Now all that he is worthy of is what you have left at the end of the pay period. What you have left after buying the coffee, after eating out every day, we're giving him what we got left. When he used to be worthy of your sacrifice. We depend on Jesus for blessings and prosperity, but we commune with the blessings more than the one who gives the blessings. And we have left Jesus at the altar, and he is standing there with open arms waiting and wondering, when are you going to give him your full yes? And one thing I love about Jesus is that he always gives us a way to return before it's too late. He gives us a remedy, and I want you to write these three things down. We're going to see it in verse 5. He says, remember, repent, and return. Remember, repent, and and return. Verse 5 says, the first thing I need you to do is consider how you have fallen. Consider how far you have fallen. The Greek translation for that word is remember. Remember how far you have fallen. Remember when Jesus was actually enough for you. I need you to remember that time. Because in order to recover your first love, you must first recognize your current condition. You must first recognize how far away from the mark that you have fallen. Jesus is saying, remember the love you had for me at first where you wasn't just studying the scripture to be studying it. Now now we just study the scripture to justify our sin. We study in scripture to prove an argument. But when's the last time you sat down and you just studied the word of God to commune with Jesus? To obey him more. Not to argue with him, but to obey him more. Jesus is saying, remember when you served because your heart simply wanted to please me. Whether anybody shouted your name out or not. Whether anybody patted you on your back or not. Remember when you were serving for an audience of one. I need you to remember that place. That's the first thing I need you to do. Next he says, repent. Once you remember and recognize how far you have fallen away from your first love, repent. Okay, and repent, it means to make a radical. Everybody say radical. Repent means to make a radical U-turn. It does not mean a 360. It means to take a radical U-turn. It means to get off of the highway, take the exit, loop around, and go the opposite way. That's what repent means. And I want you to hear me on this. When you really repent, when you really turn, It will involve putting plans in place to change your habits. When you really repent, it will cause you to change your calendars and reprioritize your schedule. When you really repent, you will block pages on Instagram that tempts your lust. When you really repent, you will look at your commitments and make the proper adjustments in order to restore your intimacy with God. That's what repentance looks like. You haven't repented yet until you reconstruct your life to support your new commitment to God. You cannot repent without confession. And we must acknowledge the fact it's more than just saying, I'm sorry. We must acknowledge the fact that somewhere down the line, 
we fell more in love with money than Jesus. We must acknowledge the fact that somewhere down the line, we fell more in love with our significant other than Jesus. We fell more in love with opportunity than Jesus. We fell more in love with our children than Jesus. And we must confess that we fell more in love with gigs than Jesus. And do you know what that's called? It's called idolatry. And we must confess before Jesus that we are in love with other lords. And we must confess that other things and other people have been getting a little bit of our worship every single day. We must confess that we have let other things become more important in our lives than Jesus. And we must repent. And the last thing Jesus says is return. I'm getting ready to end. He says, return. Return to your first love. And when you think about a relationship that has gone cold, when you think of a relationship that has gone stale, it's because someone in that relationship abandoned the things they did at first. Jesus is calling his church. He's calling us, you and I, to come back to him. We used to listen for his voice. We used to take time and pray before we said yes. We used to seek his face before we jumped into relationships, before we accepted job offers. We used to weep for those who did not know Jesus. But we have walked away, and Jesus is calling us to return. He's beckoning us to return. He's calling us back to our first love. And so today, the question on the table is, are you willing to do whatever it takes to come back to him? That's the question you're going to have to wrestle with today, the rest of this week, the rest of your life. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to come back to Jesus? Jesus.